this gentleman behind me right here is none other than George Clinton. He has been writing, recording, and, revolu and revolutionizing music for six decades uh, with his bands Parliament and Funkadelic. He has, pub he has produced 40 hit singles, and that's not even counting the samples. He is one of the most sampled artists of all time with over 2,000 samples of his music being used. And you can ask him questions by going on to social media with the hashtag Berkeley Online Live. And he is also a 2012 honorary doctorate recipient from Berkeley College of Music. So I'm going to strap on the headphones and chat with Dr. Funkenstein. How are you? How you doing? Pretty good. I've been deep. I've been deeply deep-ticked. I got my rabies shot, and I'm ready to bury the bone. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about, uh, I mentioned that you're one of the most sampled artists of all time. And in your book, you talk about uh, the artists who sampled you. But w what was the first awareness you had of people sampling your music? The first awareness I had was um, De La Soul, Me, Myself, and I. Yeah. When that, when that one came out, they came to me and asked me. You know, they wanted a sample. I had heard lots of people rap to it, but I never heard a record. You know, even though Sugar Hill Gang had did one, I hadn't heard it yet. Yeah. But when De La Soul was the first one I actually heard. Nice. And they were, the, they were the first one to pay me, too. <laughs> do you, you know, do you get itemized checks that say, you know, this is from this sample and this is from that sample? We're beginning to now. Yeah. I've been fighting for, I've been fighting for years. You know, but we're beginning to get checks from, from that now. Right. So what, what over your career has been the, the sample that is like, netted you the most money do you have any idea what that i got myself yeah uh, would have been me myself and i oh really that would have been the, yeah the rest of them i didn't get i never i never got paid for them till oh man like a, oh. i mean co that's what i'm saying oh wow. it's just okay. not it's, it's just not starting to pay off well that's good patience patience and perseverance oh so, no you got your have paid and, and so all the Dr. Dre stuff, you, you haven't seen a penny from that either? Oh, no. We fight right now to get paid from straight out of Compton. Oh, man. So now with the advent of sampling, did that ever change your whole process for songwriting at all? Like did that, did, hey, here's a good groove. Maybe this will be a good something somebody will sample. Did that ever enter your mind in the, in the writing process? I actually, I actually put out a record called Sample Summer Disc and sample some of that. Right, right. Just just for that purpose, you know, we still do. You know, that's some, I go through the same procedure, procedure myself. I sample uh -huh. the song that we made. I sample the new song that we made. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, this what, what, what we're talking about today is songwriting. So tell me about your process. You, you don't play an instrument. And how how does the are are you humming you're humming for the musicians basically right? Basically, we call it head session. Head stashing. The head session. Okay, head session. Yeah, just hum the part to the guitar player, hum the part to the bass player, until we get a groove going. Then put a melody with the keyboard player or horns. I mean, that's one way. I'm from old school. So I can actually sit down and write a song in my head first and then have somebody arrange the whole song. But since today is more about hip hop, you know, I try to do what they do in, in whatever time period we're in. How does it vary with pl from player to player? Will you be kind of a stickler for them? No, that's not the bass line I was doing. It's like this. Or will you be adapting to when they play something slightly different? Both ways. Both ways. If they can't get what I'm saying and they come up with a better lick, I'll take, I'll take that. Yeah. We call it, clo we call it close enough for funk. <laughs> you know, but then sometimes I have to get one musician to interpret it 
for another musician what I'm saying. Some of them can hear me better than others. Does, do you find it varies? Uh, you know, you've been in this business for so long and, and collaborating with people for so long. And you work with a lot of younger players now, like you work with Kendrick Lamar. Did, did you find right. working, working with some of the younger players, they have a different approach? Or is it just basically the universal language of music? Basically, it's the universal language of music. You know, with, with hip hop, you, they just take whatever you do and make some out of it. Mm -hmm. I can just go in there and start running my mouth and they'll be satisfied before I get started. <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're, they're probably easier than actually making commercials. Right. Commercials, they just, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's all the time you got. But hip hoppers that do it even quicker than that. Just, they tell me, go in there and do what you do. And, and I, have I, to, I, have to, I have to figure out what do I do. <laughs> how, how often are you writing? Well, I'm just getting back into it a lot lately. I put the album out. First, you got to shake the gate. Yeah. That that has got me back into the spirit that we're doing a new album right now called Medicaid Fraud Dog. Like I said, in the last album, we had 33 songs on it. This one won't be that long, but it's going to have a lot of songs on it. <laughs> nice. With your own contribution to writing, do you, you know, carry a notebook around with you, or, or do you just save it all until you're there in the session? The phone I got in my hand right now is the best thing that could ever happen. Yeah, I can dic I can dictate it on that, and it, it can even spell the words that I can't uh -huh. spell. <laughs> that that used to keep me from writing a lot of songs because I couldn't spell the words. <laughs> But with, with the iPhone or with the phone, period. Right. You just say it and then write it down for you. Right, right. So when, when you are going back at those words, do you, how, how do you preserve the, the melody? Do you have a, a recording device that you're using or, or do you just look at the words yeah. and know exactly? Yeah, I got a recording device on the phone. I can put it on the notes or I can put it, I can sing it. Right, right. But I, I I won't commit to a melody too too quick unless it's something really special. Uh huh. I'll just do the a basic atonal type of melody just for the line. Right. And then then come back later on and figure out what I was thinking. It, it's interesting having seen seen you play a number of times and. Uh, the experience is just, it's a, it's a celebratory experience. And then sometimes on record, though, there's more um, thoughtful, uh, introspective works in there. I guess, how, how are you, when you're writing, are you writing for the stage or writing for the headphones? Well, basically, you try to write for the stage, but it's pretty hard to come off, you know, on all of the pro tools and the digital things. You got to do it so sterile that you right. can't actually get you can't actually get down on um, tape, but you do on stage. Right. We've always we've always had that problem over the years trying to do what we do on stage on record. Uh huh. Pretty hard to pretty hard to capture. So all right, I'm gonna take a few questions now from uh, the readers who have su have submitted. Alex. And Quisidor Weinstein wants to know, um, oh, this is what I was just asking. How do you balance between lyrics that are fun and funky and lyrics with deep, meaningful messages? Probably, I don't probably distinguish between the, 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 the two. They, yeah. all seem, they all seem funny to me. <laughs> and no, knowing how people can take something serious and, and that be funny to them or vice versa. So I'll do it either way just to be annoying sometimes. Uh -huh. I'll make some, something that sounds serious be really stupid or silly. Right, right. Or the, or the other way around. I was calling myself being funny when I said, free your mind, your ass will follow. Then later on, I started seeing what people thought of it. And they made, oh, okay, I can see where it could be deep. But when I did it, I was just being clowning. 
Uh-huh. You know, and I would have somebody that interpreted it for me say, no, that's pretty deep. Yeah. And then I got to go back and act like I was deep. <laughs> well, it's funny, though. I mean, that I, I don't... I, I'm not sure I believe you that it's all silly. You know, I mean, there's like a song like Biological Speculation, which that's pretty deep, right? Uh, yeah, but I was being funny again. <laughs> you know, um, we, we can just be a test to a bunch of people on the planet. Right. You know, I was calling, I was, you know, we have biological speculation. You know, we we might not be all we think we are. Right. And I, I know how deep it, you know, the, the insinuation is. Uh -huh. But I was, I was still trying to be silly about it. Right. Well, what's the what's the most serious song you've ever written? Hmm. Probably good thoughts, bad thoughts. Yeah. And I read most of that somewhere, so I just like flipped the concept in my own head. Okay. And changed, you know, words, but the thought I read somewhere in a book. I was really seriously trying to say that our minds are messed up. Uh -huh. And we try, and we trying to straighten things out with our brain, and that's messed up. Right. So until we get that fixed, you know, we won't be able to straighten nothing else out. But I was, I really was, in my um, peace and love days. Then uh -huh. probably some good, probably some good acid. <laughs> what what song would you say like you want? people to remember you most by and quote the most would, would it be good thoughts bad thoughts or if you don't like the effect don't produce the cause like what what line from that in particular would, would you want people to you know to see on a quote to see in a you, book of quotations you say you don't like where you're at but you can make a change if you accept the blame Stay in control of your reactions. It will determine the effect of any situation. You have the power to negate any also causing feeling that prohibits you to think. That's if great. You don't like the, that, that, that one right there. I'm yeah. kind of proud of that. <laughs> yeah, that, that is good. Again, it's it seems a little bit more meaningful than than uh, the goofing around thing that you were talking about. Again, I, I, like I said, I try to be sarcastic about it. Yeah. 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 I still try to I still try to do it where it's funny. Um, so we're about at the halfway point, which is where we do a segment uh, that's called "Stuck in the Middle." So do, do you have a song that you're working on right now that you can't figure out where to go with it? Oh, man. Um, I, one, Sly Stone gave me a concept. And I can't, he said, uh, I called him up and he was supposed to be sick. I said, man, you sound good. He said, only you can hear the high in my hello. And I told him, I said, if you don't write this song in a week or two, I'm going to write it. Yeah. But I, I said the line, I said the line in a song, but I never tried to write the song about that. Tried to write the song about that. Now, have you ever tried to bring that to collaborators and say, like, all right, come on, let's, let's, let's do this? Oh, I have done that, yes. But with that one, it's just not taken yet. No, I haven't done it with that one yet. Oh, okay, okay. I probably got a couple other ones like that. So here's a question. Uh, this is from uh, Phil Strack. It's a great question. He's just basically paraphrasing the title of your book. And so, George, ain't that funkin' kind of hard on you? Uh, That's his question. <laughs> but no, it's not, no, it's not. Like I said, I was hard when I started. I'll be hard when I get through. But if yeah. you like what you, if you like what you're doing, it ain't work anyway. I mean, I actually have fun doing what I do. So, no, it ain't hard. Uh, here's one coming from Billy Z. Uh, other than sex, drugs, and rock and roll, what inspires you? Ain't shit else left. What? what? <laughs> I say, ain't nothing left. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But you know, when you get 76 years old, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, 
stuff like that started to inspire you if you haven't been inspired by it before then. Uh-huh. But that, that started looking appealing all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. You know, play, playing with the kids and shit like that. Yeah. Being yeah, yeah you, have, you have great great grandchildren, right? Yes. I got on the road right now. That's great. Yeah, I saw, when I last saw you perform, I, I think your grandson was doing some, uh, doing some rhymes, right? Three grandsons, uh, three granddaughters, and a daughter and a son. And, and are they all involved? Yes, they're all on stage right now. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. That's who you, that's who you saw. Yeah, I, I bet when you first started out, you had, did you have any inclination that you'd be doing it as long, long enough to have grandchildren on stage with you? No, I never thought of it like that. Yeah. But, but I also never thought I'd quit either. That's great. Um, here's a question from Black on Black. How do you challenge yourself as a seasoned artist? What is the next level? What do you graduate to? The, 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 the new artist that sounds like he's kicking my ass. Yeah. When it, as soon as I hear somebody doing something I wish I had done, uh-huh. I, I'm like the energizing bunny. <laughs> I, I start all over again and I say, I ain't did shit. That, that must be really gratifying, though, to continue to be asked by people like Kendrick Lamar, who are at the top of the game, you know, to collaborate. That's what's inspiring about it. Yeah. It's when you, you hear somebody like that paying attention to you, you really want to get back in the game. Here's a question from Janice Hazel. Uh, what was your inspiration to incorporate the soul gospel sounds of Philippe Wynn on Not Just Knee Deep? Oh, on that one. Felipe just happened to be in there that day. Oh, really? He, he just happened to be sitting there. He had wrote his verse up while we was doing the record. We were finished. Uh huh. He, he said, uh, "Bub, sounds great, but one thing missing." I said, "What?" He said, "Me." <laughs> I said, "Well, go on in there," and he did just what he did on the record. Wow. He said that was. Janice Hazel, she wrote that. Yep. Tell her, and, and her cousin too. He was also. <laughs> oh, oh, wow! That, I didn't even realize that that this person's related to Eddie Hazel. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, it, this is from Kim Ward. In your autobiography, you wrote about the risks of political songwriting. A lot has changed in the music industry since the release of Cosmic Slop. Do you think that artists are now able to express themselves more freely? Well, like Kendrick Lamar said, if you're under 30, he said he got that from Tupac. And for real, that's the way it is. You you couldn't probably do stuff like America Eats It's Young or nothing like that. But they do a lot of stuff that you couldn't have done back then either. Like mm. Public Enemy. Public enemy. You can't do what they did no more either, but right. you can do what you can do what Kendrick did, or what Jay Z just did, which is one of the most spectacular albums I heard in a long time. Yeah, that you 444. Know? Yes, God. Yeah. I mean, he he really peed on that one. <laughs> you know, and he's my man, but he ain't he wasn't up my top of the list. Yeah. But he he busted in up there this time. Here's one from Sargam Sundrani. How do you recompose a melody as in what is already out there? How do you make changes and make it your own? Well, it's called your interpretation. Mm -hmm. You can't own the song if you just reinterpret it. You can, you can do your version of it and, and make it yours, which is what covering songs are about. Right. You know, you just have to you have to do a good job and be a stylist. You know, Aretha Franklin is real good at that. Yeah. She'll take she'll take somebody's song, and you swear you never heard it before. Yeah, you mentioned be, being a stylist, and and I know that's how you started out in uh, styling hair. Do is there any overlap there with that sort of creativity? Yeah, the concept of doing hair put me in touch with the, the concept of Sir Nose. You know, a cool yes. cat so cool he can't get his can't get his hair wet. 
Right, right. You can't have no fun. But I, I use that imagery and that old concept for a lot of the parliaments, you know, supposed to be cool songs. Right, right. Like Make My Funk the People. That was dope talk in the barbershop. Right, right. You know, so, yeah, I use a lot of the barbershop. And not only that, but in my appearance, a lot of them was anti-cool, a lot of them was cool. Right. Funkadelic, we tried to be as dirty as we possibly could be. Uh-huh. Diapers, diapers, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, this, here's a question coming from uh, Bennett Varsho, and he sent along a video, actually, of him uh, giving $10 to a guitarist who was uh, standing on the street busking to play Maggot Brain, and the guy did it. Uh, but anyway, his question is, in Cleveland, you kept the crowd going for 20 minutes after they pulled the plug. What is the longest you've done that for? For about 20 minutes, and they turned the, they turned the, the electricity back on. Yeah. We did it in Philadelphia. We did it in Philadelphia about 20 to 30 minutes. And the people wouldn't stop, so we just we just banged it on and kept singing. Uh, here, here's a question from Stephen Zakos. Being one of my biggest inspirations, I've always wanted to ask what advice you could give to an aspiring funk drummer. Keep it, keep it on the one. Yeah. Keep it on the one. You know, but like I, the only thing I can say to anybody aspiring to do anything really is do the best you can and then funk it as far as the funk like where where do you reach for the funk from like when, when you say and funk it like where 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 just, is that metaphysical place just just let go you like they use the fourth loop just yep. let go and jam let let go and jam nice and, nice. and just settle settle back don't try to show off just get in the pocket with everybody and jam Funk could take over itself. Um, let's see. Here's another question from uh, this one's from Dwan Brown. Are we ever going to see all of the living members on stage again? All the Funkadelic and Parliament All Stars who are still live and not playing again? Sure, I'm sure you will. I'm sure yeah. that happens every now and then. You know, yeah. but everybody got their own things. But a lot of them are not here with us anymore. Right, right. You know, but, but like you say, the remaining ones, we, we, we come together every now and then. Uh, here's one from Carlton Solomon. Who, in your opinion, is really bringing the funk today? Well, I think you answered that with uh, Kendrick and Jay-Z, but is there anybody who, outside of the hip-hop scope and just straight-up funk, who's doing that? Well, I, would, I guess you would call Flying Lotus, the Thundercat. That, that crew is... They, they, you know they're jazzy, but they they got like the freshest funk. Yeah. Thing, you know they mix they mix it in with the uh, uh, DJ scene, and so you got the best of both worlds, a band and a DJ. Mm-hmm. They had a lot. To, they had a lot to do with Kendrick's album. Yeah. As far as uh, you're currently in that movie that Flying Lotus has done, are you hearing <laughs> a lot of are you hearing a lot of feedback about that? Don't watch it while you're eating. Right, that's what everybody says. <laughs> Wait, did he have to ask you twice to be in that, or did, did you were you right away? Well, no, it's funny because um, he, you know, like I'm always talking about got that doo doo, got yep. that shit, uh, <laughs> pro you know, the doo doo chases the band. So I'm familiar with the concept. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So Talking you were you were on board you were on board right away then. Yeah, but you know, hell yeah, alien coming out my ass. Yeah, I can go for it. <laughs> Is there ever anything that you are asked to do collaborative wise that you just wouldn't wouldn't do? Oh, there's a few of those. <laughs> yeah, I I don't even want to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on then. Uh, here's okay. another here's another question from uh, Jason Landry. 
Uh, having worked in the music industry for quite some time, is there something you wish you learned early on in terms of music education that you could have could have helped you today? The drugs didn't work after the first time or two. So I have uh, very, in the spirit of the less serious things, I have a silly question to ask of you. Can you guess why once a week for the past 20, 30 years or so, I get flashlight in my head when I'm taking the garbage to the curb? <laughs> flashlight? Yeah. Ah, uh, damn, I don't know why that was. I can't answer that one. Well, it's it trash be... night. <laughs> oh, it's trash night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, <That> so <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> trash night. <laughs> Every week, without fail, it's garbage night, and it's like trash night. I, I, I had to do something like that on the market. Yeah. I did it for Gonzo. <laughs> yeah, what did you yeah, and Gonzo I do? Feel... I, it was a flash something. I mean, it was something light. I forgot what it was. Okay. I to look it up again. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll look that up. Uh, well, George, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, keep on keeping on. And, and thank you so much. Roof. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all very much for tuning in. And... A uh, special thank you going out to Chrissy Walter, Josh Chagani, Jesse Burkowski, Kaylee Kravitz, Tim Scholl, Jana Jackson, Mike King, Debbie Cavalier, everybody at Berkeley Online, really, and Benji Rogers, and George Clinton himself. Mm -hmm.